I might not know what I'm doing, but I know how to look for the questions and figure out the path to get to where to get to where I might have a good outcome for whatever odd step I might take. And it's really nice to admit to myself that I kind of don't know what I'm doing at least half the time that I start any new project or venture or anything. Um, I would say it's way more than that, actually. Welcome. I'm Doug Casina. I'm an artist, a gallerist, a curator, and a collector. And this is Artbound, where we deconstruct the myths and misconceptions of the art world. We have the conversations here with artists that aren't going to be found anywhere else. Welcome to Artbound. In this episode, we're digging into what it means to take the leap. And by the leap, I mean taking your art career into a business. Today, I have some fabulous guests that are going to help me dive into this subject. First is James Allen Holmes. James is the executive director for the Cherokee Ranch and Castle Foundation. Uh, He has 18 years where he served as a trustee for the Denver Art Museum. He's also on the board of directors for the Arts District on Santa Fe, and he's just opening his first art gallery in the Golden Triangle Museum District in Denver. Thanks for joining us, James. Doug, it's a real honor to be here, and as a uh, loyal listener to Artbound, it certainly is a a pleasure to be here and, and to be a part of this, so thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to have you, James. Our other guest is Michael Dowling. Uh, Michael is an artist that I've had the pleasure of working with over a number of years, and I personally collect his work. Uh, He studied in Florence, Italy, at the Lorenzo de' Medici. Um, He's also owned several iterations of different art businesses, from galleries to art consulting businesses and uh, teaching as well. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really honored that you would include me in this. You know, one of the questions I have, like, first of all, here we are, we're all in the studio. This is the first time on the podcast that I've had all the guests in the studio because we've been recording it during the pandemic. Like, what was one of the things that happened to you guys during the pandemic that kind of changed your art practice, you know, minus not actually seeing your audience? I would say the biggest thing that changed my art practice was that I took six months off of doing anything except for mountain biking with my kids and didn't make any art and didn't really even worry about the people who were getting in touch with me wanting to do what little we could as far as some sort of art programming and started. And after about six months of that, just um, realized that the entire vacation that I'd taken in that way allowed me to not only rest, which I really needed after some really busy years, Um, but it allowed me to get far more thoughtful about what I was making and, um, and why it was important to me outside of the business of it, um, and finding that balance again. So I would say that was the biggest thing. What did you discover? I actually discovered that I was kind of doing it right. And I was a little bit surprised. I went back to just drawing to draw and getting into my sketchbook and found that the things that I was making out of the pleasure to make them were very much the things that I was making to put out into the world to be in galleries and to be part of the be part of my income and be part of that and the whole world of things too. Well, you could have just called me and I could have told you you were doing it right. <laughs> well, because I so uh, full disclosure, I uh, used to represent Michael. I have maybe 20 of his paintings in my own personal art collection nowadays. I've, uh, I'm very popular, Doug's. <laughs> and, and I adore his work and his art making process. Um, so, uh, you know, and I've always seen that kind of playfulness in your work and the way that it seems like you're never kind of forcing it into some kind of narrative that it's always feels like an authentic uh, representation of self uh, in your practice. So it's good that you were able to kind of re, um, re-verbalize that for yourself. Yeah, it really solidified it for me. And I guess that's always a struggle that I have is that worry that the business of being an artist will take away from the spirit of being an artist. And for me, I found out that it kind of didn't and felt a lot better moving back into, uh, into really starting to make things again and got really busy with, you know, just getting back to the studio after that 
And really, it was a it was a pleasure to get back to work. Well, and I think we're going to really dive a lot deeper into that as we progress through the podcast and start asking about those business choices and what brought you into it. That's you know kind of the whole topic for the show. Uh, James, what changed about your art practice or what uh, moved forward during the pandemic that kind of surprised you? It's interesting hearing Michael's answer because I had a very just the opposite side of the coin. For me, what I did because of the changes in my day-to-day routine in my full-time job, I carved out time to really work on setting up my art business. So I did um, a lot of planning in terms of uh, what I wanted to do with my studio and, and gallery. I put in some systems to try to more formalize my, my business practice on my art and my art uh, practice And uh, that was about the first half of the pandemic. In the second half, I worked on a project that was my first public art installation. So it was kind of uh, focusing on the business the first several months and um, kind of adjusting to all the changes that suddenly were put upon all of us. And then um, really digging in from about November uh, through May and just working on one project, basically. So you weren't mountain biking. I wasn't mountain biking. I kind of like your, your idea. <laughs> and you know, because you're right, and I know that. <laughs> well, so, you know, the, the topic for this podcast is taking the leap. I think all of us in the creative field, you know, we deal with these, I, you know, there's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of other things that come into our practice about, are we ready? Are we making good enough work? Is it going to resonate with audiences? Can we do this? Can we make a living? You know, and a lot of it is about calming those internal dialogues so we can actually do the work that's important. Michael, when was it like, can you point at a specific moment in your life where you were even contemplating taking that leap or was there something that kind of, you you know, was that that point where you're like, okay, I need to move into a different direction. I need to follow this art practice. There's, uh, there's a couple times that I've actually taken big leaps and I've come to realize that I really value and actually enjoy taking those leaps and being really in that place of some fear. And one of the things that's made it so that I'm able to overcome or actually enjoy that fear is realizing that I might not know what I'm doing, but I know how to look for the questions and figure out the path to get to where, to get to where I might have a good outcome for whatever odd step I might take. And it's really nice to admit to myself that I kind of don't know what I'm doing at least half the time that I start any new project or venture or anything. Um, I would say it's way more than that, actually. So the first time I took a big leap was in my late 20s. I had been studying art on and off uh, here in Denver and uh, started an art sales company and was doing quite well and had just this amazing business partner and really enjoyed it, but knew that I needed to be painting. And so one Friday, I kind of sat down and I think I had a bit of a conversation with myself. Um, I remember sitting at my mom's kitchen table at that point for some reason, drinking tea. I think I was just stopping by her place to see her. And so I, I realized that I wanted to be painting, that I was not doing the thing I wanted to be doing in the art world, although I was doing something in the art world, which was valuable. And so I decided, oh, I'm going to go to Florence and study. And so that was a Friday. I got in touch with my business partner on a Monday, on that Monday, and told him I was going to be giving him the business and, uh, and moving to Italy and uh, focusing on that. So I bought a plane ticket that day, left on Friday, and I was in Italy. And that was a pretty good job. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. So like in one week, you kind of came to that realization and you said- it had, been, it had been in my mind for a long time, but it solidified that day somehow. Yeah. And you said, I just got to move forward with mm-hmm. this. You know, one thing that I think that you started off that question with in a really interesting way that I want to touch on is this idea of not knowing. And I think that's such a beautiful space to be at as an artist. And one thing that I I say over and over again to the artists that I work with or, you know, young artists that are that I talk with at universities is the longer you are in that space of not knowing is the better. Um, because, but that goes for everything you make, every piece, every painting. Yes. If you enter it not knowing what it's going to be, you're going to discover something amazing every time. Because you're not forcing that narrative. You're not. You don't have expectations of outcome. 
you know, and the longer that you're doing that dance, usually the better the piece becomes. Yeah, that's exactly what I've experienced. And I have never been able to articulate it. So thank you. Well, there we go. <laughs> well, that was our podcast for today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. <laughs> um, no, but if, if you don't mind me taking a bit more time on it, I made a couple other leaps like that in my life. But I think, I think the important one for this discussion and probably the most important in my life was in, I think it was 2013. It was the end of 2013. And I had been making art as half of my living and really supporting my family. And I have... Um, you know, I have a big family and a lot, uh, a lot to take care of there, which is uh, one of my favorite things in the world. But it's also, you know, it, it puts some pressure on. And so end of 2013, I had done everything. I had sold copiers and, and sold like fashion stuff and eyewear and all kinds of different things. And then kind of settled back into selling wine, which I'd done on and off for quite a few years at that point. And, uh, and really, I love wine. And uh, from studying in Italy... I lived on a vineyard for a while and really got into wine at that point, and, uh, and it was a very natural thing to be doing. And it's also a very beautiful thing to, it's a beautiful world to be in wine. But I'd been doing that for a few years, working about 50 or 60 hours a week selling wine, and working about 15 to 20 making art, and I don't mind working a lot. Um, and I keep very, very careful track of all my numbers, how much I make doing everything, how many hours I'm spending, um, how many pieces I make, uh, how much they all cost, how much the whole body of work is worth, how much everything kind of how everything works in numbers. And I really like numbers. I don't know why it's when I take breaks from painting, I actually do Sudoku and I'm just kind of a numbers person. <laughs> um, so I was looking at my numbers at the end of 2013 and realizing that I was making just a little bit less spending about 15 hours a week as an artist than I was spending 60 hours a week selling wine. And although I really enjoyed selling wine, I loved being an artist. And that was, that was truly where my heart was and where everything, where everything fit. And so I kind of talked to the company that I was working with, and right at the beginning of 2014, they just let me go. And I was like, well, what are you doing? Why are you letting me go? I helped you guys really make a great company. And, uh, and the owner never really told me, but, uh, but they made sure I had a good severance package. And he kind of created the situation in which I was able to transition to just being a full-time artist. And so he really created the step for me and allowed me to take that step. It was a step that I was going to be taking no matter what. I just didn't know exactly how I was going to be doing it. And that kind of did it, basically losing my job and uh, and just falling into, you know, the craziest thing is that my fallback thing was being an artist. <laughs> Do you think that they knew that you wanted to go a different direction they and did. helped you along? Yeah. The owner, I actually had a specific conversation with him about two months before, and he asked me why I didn't just leave the company. And I explained to him that I entered the company with some dedication to him, and I wasn't going to give up on that dedication, especially at a time that I knew he needed the people around, which is the holiday time for wine is pretty big. So yeah, I think, I think he had a pretty good sense that that was a push that I needed and did help me out with that. But I was going to be making that step no matter what. Um, but one of the things I looked at, again, was the numbers. And the numbers made sense. If I can make, you know, at that time I was making about 40000 a year on art and about fifty or fifty five on, on um, wine. And I was spending way less time making that amount on art. And so it just made sense that if I doubled my time on art, or actually tripled and then some, that I could at least make double what I was making on art. And that's about how the numbers worked. Within, within the first year of me doing that, I didn't quite hit my same income as I had with wine and art. And then my second year I did. And so, um, so yeah, it was a good leap. Well, and I think numbers are incredibly important. And I speak to this all the time with artists about when they're reaching goals that they need to. Um, a lot of it is like, okay, how much art do you need to produce at the price point that you're selling them for, uh, you know, even if you're getting great sales figures, like, you know, maybe you make a 20 paintings a year and if you're a rock star, you're selling half of them right off the bat. So what do those 20 paintings need to be selling for? Or do you need to be making a hundred paintings a year so that you're selling 50 of them, yeah. you know, and how do those numbers actually play out? And so I think that's something good to kind of look at when you're coming up with like a business plan, because at some point or another, really, as much as this is a passion, it's also a business because that's how we feed ourselves and our families and and are able to make more art is by selling our art and creating a business out of that. And what you're saying, Doug, is really important because I think having the um, the commitment to learn where you fit in the market and then the courage to ask for that. I know a lot of artists that sell work and just use your example, you know, let's say they, they make 20 and they sell 10, but 
not doing the research to find out where you sit in the marketplace and it's the tendencies to undersell yourself. So, you know, being courageous enough to, to ask the price that you think your art is worth uh, based on whatever you feel you've put into it and you want to get back from it or where you find yourself in the marketplace. One of the things that I did was um, went to a lot of galleries and walk into a gallery and say, okay, can I see my art next to that piece and does it stand up? And if it does, okay, then what is that price point? Or if I go in and see some work, I remember going to a show, uh, Amy Metier's show, and being humbled by that and going, okay, I got some more work to do. And so my work isn't quite at that level. And I, so I can't get those prices. But I, I think that in running the numbers, one of the critical factors is what is your what is your price? And having the courage to stand in there, put the label on and stand by it. Because you can you can create a lot of sales by meeting a lot of different people's price points, you know? But like you're saying, you might have to end up making two or three times the number of paintings in a year to make the same goals, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I actually pay attention to the percentage of work that sells. Yeah. And so I know that if I want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, I actually have to make $400,000 worth of art. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, I have to, I have a production matrix and that has how many paintings at the $10,000 level, how many paintings at the $5,000 level, how many drawings at this level, all the other things. And there are about 20 different products. And I have to know how many of those things I have to make to hit my $400,000 quota so that I can make the 100000 in sales if I can possibly make that. Yeah. But that also goes to thinking about what you're going to make. And for me, I had to decide that I was going to be a business about the diversity of work I was going to make. It would be lovely to think that I could just make one giant painting and sell every one of them and have, you know, this, I don't know, 10 by 20 foot painting that sold for $100,000 and I'm done. But I knew that I needed to be able to sell a couple big things, quite a few medium things and a ton of small stuff. And so I needed to figure out those small things that felt good to make that that people could just buy, you know, without having to really consider their budget, really consider measuring everything in their house and make sure it fit. And so having those things at the three, four, five hundred dollar range was super important. And those tend to be kind of simpler drawings and uh, and these drawings that I do in in uh, recycled books. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to not only make a ton of work, which is another really valuable thing to do as an artist once, you know, once you start making a piece every day or maybe a few pieces every day, you find your practice really accelerating. But to have that product range was super important. So James, tell us how, um, you know, as you indicated earlier on in, the, in this segment, it, you have a full-time job. I do. And art is now kind of a new job as well for you. Could you tell us kind of how this all came about and what your background is and what brought you into your art making practice? But would, would you also tell us how do you feel that balances as far as, you know, making art as that passion thing, making art somewhat as a business too, and how it balances with your time and with your energy and having a full-time gig? Yeah, and I'm living right in the middle of that right now, and I'd love to share that as well. And that's why I love having the two of you <laughs> on here, is because Michael has done like a little bit of everything in the art world. Yeah. And James, this is like, you just sold your first painting out of your new gallery space this week, right. you know? So that's like one of the, so you're just now like, you're, you're dangling that foot off the edge. Yes. You know, so, so tell me how, how did you start your art making practice? Because I think it's a really fascinating story. Yeah, it started on literally a perfect Saturday afternoon. Uh, I have an extensive background in, um, in, in equestrian sports. I used to show jump horses. And uh, when, I, when I took on my current full-time role as executive director of Cherokee Ranch and Castle Foundation, I started uh, working with quarter horses. And I had this mare that um, just from the very beginning, it was, she was a problem mare when I, when I bought her. Um, I discovered that the first time I brought her back to our ranch. And after presenting to a couple of other trainers who didn't want to take her on, I decided to start working with her myself. And after a, a couple of months of some really productive work in the arena, uh, one of the guys in the barn uh, in, said, you know, it's a beautiful day. Let's, uh, let's ride out to Cherokee State Park and go for a trail ride. And I thought, you know, that sounded like a good idea. And we rode these horses out and, and my horse, her name is Missy. She did a great job of really facing a lot of obstacles on the way out to the park. Uh, and I'm talking about like walking around roadways that were busy with four lane traffic and through a concrete, you know, underpass and a lot of other things that, you know, can definitely spook a horse. And I really 
felt this confidence that maybe we'd had a breakthrough and she was going to actually end up being okay. So we did this big loop in the park and we're heading back towards the barn. And uh, I discovered one of Missy's triggers, which is that she's what they call barn sour, which means it's a horse that wants to go back to the barn and they want to go to the barn like right now. <laughs> so um, we're, we're heading back and we come to that underpass and a guy came through there uh, with like four dogs tethered on leashes. And, you know, usually the trail etiquette is horses, bicyclists, runners, walkers. And uh, he didn't get the etiquette book because he just kept walking straight down the trail, which meant I had to yield to him. So when I stepped Missy off the trail and we stopped making progress towards the barn, she dropped her right shoulder, which put me off balance, spun to the right, which put me on the inside of her, and then she bucked. And needless to say, I came off of her and it happened within an instant. And on the way down, um, as she was racing towards the barn, she kneed me in the back of the head and broke my neck. So this is in February of 2018. I didn't realize how se severely I was injured at the beginning. I kind of collected my thoughts. Missy took off through the tunnel. So the friend of mine that was with me went to go get her off the roadway. I was afraid she's run up onto a busy, you know, Peoria street and, and cause an accident. And um, I kind of got myself together and dusted myself off and started walking back to the barn. And with every step, I felt a little less good. <laughs> so I knew that, you know, something was wrong and I thought it might be a broken collarbone or, 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 or something, you know, definitely was, was not right. So I get in my truck, not the smartest thing to do after having a traumatic accident. And I drove myself to the hospital. By the time I got there, I couldn't figure out how to open the door to get out. I was literally sitting in this emergency room parking lot, trying to figure out how to open the door door to my truck. And after about 20 minutes, I put it together and slid out of the truck and walked in. And after doing a CAT x-ray CAT scan and MRI, I overheard the nurse talk to my wife who had arrived then at the hospital and heard her say that the uh, surgeon will be right down. So I knew something was seriously wrong when I heard the word, the surgeon will be right down. And sure enough, I had broken my neck. He said to me in just very straight terms that, uh, you know, you're, you're very lucky that you walked in here. Uh, your neck is incredibly unstable. And my immediate recommendation to you is that you undergo surgery to do a fusion of your C6 to 7. And you've got this little piece of your facet, which is the little wings on the back of your vertebrae, that's uh, perilously close to your spinal cord. So you don't really have the luxury of um, waiting. But if you want to get a second opinion, I can get you stable. <laughs> and uh, just don't sneeze lying down, don't fall. <laughs> and I said, no, uh, I, I believe what you're telling me. I don't need a second opinion. We have to, we have to do this. So the next morning we did that. So after the surgery, he gives me the rundown on like what my life is going to be like for the next eight to 12 weeks, which included essentially being homebound and best sitting down somewhere. And my personality doesn't really fit with being homebound or sitting for long periods of time. So um, I was on the phone talking to my mom, actually, after my call to the surgeon. And uh, she said, you know, when you were a kid, you used to love to draw and paint. So why don't you start drawing, drawing or painting? And my wife got home that night and I told her about both conversations. And she said, you know, your mom's right. You know, you love horses so much. Why don't you start painting horses? So I thought, okay. And so we had some just stuff that probably my kids had, something in the house we kind of pulled together. And um, what, what I found was that fig figuratively, which is the, the art that I used to love so much, like I used to love like uh, Munning's horse fox hunting scenes and stuff like that, you know. But really what I was drawn to do is create abstraction. And the, the thing, the reason I mentioned that is um, when I think about how I felt about abstract work in the past, I just didn't understand it. So as a collector or someone observing art, I didn't really understand the language of abstraction. I could understand the literal, you know, representation of something. But when I was uh, acting in the role of a creator, I didn't want to look at those things, I really was just drawn towards painting emotion. And maybe part of it was it was a healing process. And so maybe the emotion was the thing that was most real to me at that time. But um, as I do with most things, I started sharing these little, you know, six by six box canvas uh, paintings I was doing on Facebook. And so people would comment, oh, that I like that one or whatever, which just gave me like the motivation to like do another one. And before I know it, 
I, and it kind of goes back to what you said, Michael, about if you're making a piece or making multiple pieces every day, your painting practice gets better. I think even in, in that point in time, not having any intention on being an artist, calling myself an artist, selling any work, or really even beyond Facebook showing any work, I think the repetition and every day I was doing it, and so the canvases started getting bigger and bigger, and I'm having my wife go to Hobby Lobby at that time and get bigger and bigger canvases. And before I knew it, I'd created like 40, 45 paintings. And, you know, I could, I could look at those paintings and I could tell what was going on emotionally as I'm sitting here, you know, basically in my house for 24 hours a day for 12 weeks and what I was trying to communicate through this act of expressing, uh, through art making. And after I'd been doing this for a year painting, I got out of the house in, in like 11 weeks and, uh, I continued my painting practice and continued sharing those paintings out on, on Facebook and a friend of mine messaged me one day and said, you know, I'm curating a show at a gallery down in Parker, which is where I live. And I think your work would be really fit into the show. And I told her, no, I'm not, don't have any interest in showing my work. I certainly don't feel like I'm interested in selling my work, so I don't want to do it. And after about two weeks of persistent nudging me and prodding me and taunting me, <laughs> um, I decided to actually do the show. And um, the experience of that first show then redefined everything that I think in terms of the way I felt about doing art. Basically been showing ever since then. What was it about that first show? Well, you know, when she finally convinced me to do it, I had like two days to pull it together. She said, oh, I need 12 paintings. And I'd been painting on these little, you know, one by one square, you know, wrapped, you know, canvases that require a frame. So I'm like going to the hobby craft store and getting frames and learning how to frame up art and then having to deliver this art. The thing about that first show is that uh, I sold my first work, which was uh, a neat experience. The person kept saying to me, I, I like this piece. I could see it in my house. And I kept saying, thank you for the compliment. And she finally said, James, I, I want to buy it. Yeah. I mean, literally that's how it happened. <laughs> and then the light bulb came on and Oh, okay. So I sold my first painting and that night I sold a total of four. And, and what they were doing was, um, taking everyone that came in the door, got a little slip of paper and they got to put on there. You know, the, the question was, please, uh, put a note by the piece that is your favorite piece. And at the way out the door, put it in the little basket. And at the end of the night, we're going to tally it up and we'll have a people's choice award. And um, my primary painting in that show won the people's choice award. So I sold my first four paintings. I got a people's choice award. This is all going pretty well. But what really hooked me on this idea of showing and, and changing my perspective about what I'm doing with my art is I love having conversations about the pieces. I love when someone's standing there looking at the painting you know, they all want to know what you're communicating or what you're saying, or what does the title mean? And I wanted to hear what they, what they saw, you know, what did, what do you see in it? You know, what does it make you feel? And then I love then sharing what my story is around it and having that kind of dialogue. And I, that's something I wouldn't have known to expect as far as, um, enjoying art in that way. And, uh, so that really gave me the incentive to want to continue, you know, uh, making art and showing art to be able to have those conversations about art. And then if someone decided they wanted to buy a piece at that point, I just, it was a bonus. You know, I hadn't really made some of the business decisions I've made now, but just from a standpoint of something enjoyable to do that I could share with other people and have conversations and connection with other people. I love that, that opportunity for that. You know, one of the things now that I want to get into is, you know, this business side, I think, is very scary for people. And you both have taken that leap into the business side of it. Did you, Michael, did you have any mentors? You know, I, you said that you had kind of worked within an art uh, consulting business earlier on. You know, like in what ways did you research or prepare for the career side of artwork. It sounds like you did some numbers, but beyond that, like, did you have a role model or anybody else that you kind of reached out to? I did, and he was really shady. And it's a really <laughs> interesting thing how I learned all this. So I worked with my eventual business partner at just like a framing and like poster store. And the owner was lacking some scruples, but also just knew how to go and get it. And so when he 
needed to find business, he wasn't waiting around in the shop. He was going to find the people that would buy those kind of things. And he started to create networks. He started to create partnerships with designers. He started to create partnerships with anybody who might be doing uh, any kind of business that would need decor in their offices, their houses. And he just looked for the business. And it taught me real quick that business doesn't come to you. You go get it. And so when I started that, uh, that art sales firm, I started with the same mentality. And one of the first things I did was based on the advice of another friend who owned a small gallery and is actually still a good friend of mine. She told me, join five clubs. And I actually recommend that for an artist too. If you're going to be an artist, go join five clubs. And those clubs can be anything. And so what I did, I started playing soccer again. I joined the Chamber of Commerce. And this is for the business sales. I joined the Chamber of Commerce. I joined like a leads group, which was interesting, but sort of painful. <laughs> and, um, and I did a couple other things, but they weren't art things. They were just people out in the world. Oh, actually, I joined a group of people who like it was all office furniture, people who got together and traded leads and, uh, and tips and stuff. That was a big source of business for me. And I, I did a couple other things. I can't remember exactly what. So I did those things and I went and looked for the business and I talked to people about what I was doing as a business. And then the other thing that I did if I didn't have business, if I didn't have business coming in was just to go downtown, take, the, take an elevator to the top of a building and walk every floor and walk into every office and talk to the people in there and just find out what they had going on, see what they, see what they had uh, happening, if they needed any, anything for their offices to make it look better and, uh, and you know, every week I'd find business um, and it built up fast. Faster than I had expected it to. Sorry, where do we start with that question? <laughs> I think I think it's more important to start to talk about the, <laughs> the being an artist side of it, really. Well, but that's the I think part that really keeps people from taking that leap. You know, I think making the artwork itself is you know the part that feels natural. It feels like they're, you're compelled to create. You know, kind of like you were saying you were in this other job at the point and you were realizing that you weren't painting. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, it's kind of that idea of did you have any kind of role models or mentors who you saw as this is a business model and that this can actually happen? Yeah. So um, thank you for redirecting me. <laughs> um, I, I was with you on every floor of that elevator, yeah. though. Yeah. So my mentor actually for moving into being an artist was me as the business person in in my previous art sales business. Mm. And the way that worked was that I realized that making the art wasn't going to make it sell. And so I had to figure out something else to do that. And I figured out real quick, you need to do two things as an artist. You actually have two jobs. We well, have about 10 jobs, but the two essential jobs are you have to make it and you have to show it. If you're making good art, you're going to sell it. You're going to sell your art. If you get it in front of people, it's going to start selling. And so for me, I created, especially when I left uh, the wine sales industry, um, I created an agenda. And that agenda was based on the realization that if I showed every month, I was making a certain amount of money. Or if I showed in, in any month, I would make a certain amount of money. And so I just realized that if I want to make that kind of money every month, I had to show every month. So I started figuring out ways to show every month. And sometimes it was at a gallery and sometimes it was, you know, at a studio and sometimes it was on my mom's refrigerator and sometimes it was in some alley, but I was showing every month. And that's what I still do. I have some, actually, it's even more than that now. I have some showing activity every month or more. And it is the only way I can keep up with making sure that that the business side of it is working that well. Well, and James, before you started your art practice, um, you had been involved in the art world uh, through the Denver Art Museum. Um, and, and so did you see anybody who um, kind of inspired you towards saying, oh my gosh, this can actually happen as a career as well? It's really, you know, that, that part of it is really interesting because, you know, I'd spent, um, you know, 18 years at this point as a trustee of the art museum and working both on the collections committee and also in marketing. So, you know, and not being a maker, so not like making any touch points towards anything at all around my own goals or sense of direction. I observed a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that I've seen over time. And I certainly had a lot of friends that are artists at different levels of the art practice. I think one of the careers that I looked at, somewhat in awe actually, but I've now begun to understand to unpack some of the, the key points, is Jordan Castile, because she's a Denver, you know, a Denver artist. And she did this meteoric kind of uh, last you know, three or four years in particular. And as I began to the practice of actually exhibiting and showing art, 
um, I started looking for examples like that, you know, are there things that are replicatable? And some of them are, you know, we were talking a little bit uh, ago about, I asked Michael when we were in our break uh, about how long he's been, you know, painting and, and uh, you said to me, you did your first art class when you were 25, which is kind of late. And I kind of laughed a little bit because. And I actually, I took my first painting class at that point, but I took my first drawing class with Amy Metier when I was 19 and got a solid D. <laughs> <laughs> your potential wasn't like obvious at that point. It was not. Yeah, and, I, and I love her work, by the way. Me too. And, um, and I'm starting in you know, almost uh, double that age in terms of just my whole art career. So I've had to take a much different approach to it. You know, Winston Churchill has this famous uh, quote that he's a young man in a hurry. Like people are asking all the time, like, why is he so like obsessive about what he's doing? You know, my thing is I don't have, you know, 30 or 40 years to get to my goals, you know, in terms of what I want to do, because I'm starting so late, you know, this is really a second career. And so I, I think that, you know, I leaned into some of the people I knew that could answer some pieces of the puzzle for me in, in terms of just trying to understand how to, how to, when I start begin to formalize my art business and I learned to be really intentional about everything I do. And I'm still, I'm mean, obviously still that way that everything I do related to my art practice and particularly the business side of my art practice is very intentional. And that'd be the piece of advice that I would give to anybody that, you know, they may be in the, in the place I was, which is, and still am working a full-time job. And how do you uh, balance out, as you'd asked earlier, Michael, uh, balance out the obligations of that job and then also remain intentional about the progress you make in, you know, this kind of second career. And um, I think you have to be open to a lot of feedback, but really get quiet and make decisions for yourself because it's easy to get discouraged through some of that feedback. And if you, you know, set the goal and you're kind of clear about what you want to accomplish, take it as information to inform your thoughts. But at the end of the day, be real clear and intentional about saying yes to opportunities, you know, being, keeping your eyes open for doors that may open and don't allow any negativity in terms of the obstacles to stand in the way. Because, you know, whether you're, you know, 50 or 25 or you're 10, you know, the time you have is the time you have. And, uh, that doesn't serve you to not step forward with like a kind of a positive view with a lot of intention about what you want to, you want to have as an outcome. I think very well said there. Um, you know, one thing that I've noticed and I think there's a, a big misconception about in the art world is that there's a certain path that you have to take. Like you get this BFA, you get this MFA, you do these, you know, this type of residency program, you start showing with this style of gallery, you take classes from this, and you get to this point in your career. What other population of workers in the world would just make it all up? Yeah. That's and, and, exactly right. what we do. And, and that's exactly right. I know people who've uh, have gone the same educational route and have ended up in completely different places in their careers, even though they did the same residencies, had the same MFA programs. So that's one thing that I think we've all kind of bought into is that there is some direct route or some way. You know, a lot of the artists that I know, whether or not they had formal education or not, it took them 20 years sometimes before they really started making a living as an artist of making an art practice until their work, you know, extended to the point where they were selling regularly to where they had that momentum, where they had, you know, that discipline in their practice or that business sense to it, whatever it might be. And it really is just saying, Hey, this is, I'm going to take this leap. So Michael, like, since you've done a little bit of everything, you've taught, you've consulted, you've had a gallery. What were some of the things that you just weren't prepared for? All of it, really. And, you know, the funny thing is, is I thought I might be kind of prepared. I was not. And I think that my favorite thing I wasn't prepared for was teaching. And it was something that I never wanted to do. And then I kind of found a point where I just wanted to explore if I knew what I was doing well enough in my practice to actually be able to talk about it with people. So I started teaching just a little bit and absolutely fell in love with it and realized very quickly that I was going to learn more from teaching than all of my students put together. And I truly did. It helped me really master what I was doing to a level that I was very happy with it. Um, that was a very valuable experience. So that was, that was quite a surprise. 
and I still love doing it and I don't have enough time for it right now in my life, but I still do teach a little bit and it's a, it's still a very, very valuable thing for me to be doing. I, you know, I, I think it's really easy to convince ourselves that we're no, like we know a certain part of our practice, you know, like we know why we're doing that until we have to explain it to somebody else. And then it helps you like <laughs> redefine the whole thing. And you're like, Oh wait, that's really what I was doing. <laughs> You know, and, and and I've seen that over and over again, not only just through myself, but through artists that I work with. Um, uh, as we indicated, James, this is this is like day one for you. Like your your sign isn't up at the gallery yet. You're still like settling in to the studio. What like what questions have you had that you're like still kind of feeling out? Like what what what's coming up for you right now? You know, one of the the real surprises and. I would be very interested in getting your feedback, both of you guys, on this. I, I've been really resistant, and I started to ask Michael during the break about inventory and, and, and producing product and producing work. I, I've been resistant to doing prints, like in my practice. Like I've never have done a print, right? That's just, uh, for whatever reason, I just didn't have a reason, but I just felt like what I wanted to do was, was create original work and sell original work. And even when I would do First Fridays in the art district, you know, I'd see people walking around carrying prints and I thought, you know, that's a price point issue. So I'm going to make smaller paintings and give them something they can take away, but it's an original, original work. So I was persuaded uh, just last week and to, by a company to create uh, a print of two different paintings I'd done on paper uh, during the pandemic, my first work during the pandemic. And I happened to have these uh, sitting on my desk and I had an art consultant friend that um, I had just had some coffee and visited with, and she came over to the gallery afterwards, and she goes, well, what is that? And I said, um, oh, they're these prints. I was all excited about these limited edition prints I was going to do. And she said, don't do it and don't ever do it. <laughs> and I thought, okay, that's interesting. And we're going to have a conversation we didn't fully have yet about the reason for that. But the reason I bring up the story is, is I think there are things that I know there's a lot I don't know. Like as I'm sitting here and that's the way you say it is exactly right. I feel like I'm on day one. I look at Doug, all the things you've done in the art world. And I look at what I'm learning about you, Michael, and all you've done is I'm very much at the very beginning of that starting line of just experience. So everything that I'm doing, so much of it is, um, instinct, you know, up to this point. Um, certainly a lot of it is just following advice uh, from the people that I feel like I can trust their demonstrated knowledge, you know? So, you know, I would come to you and ask you a question and based on what I know about you, Doug, I would take what you say with a lot of weight. You know, I'm learning that about you today, Michael. Uh, there are other people that offer advice and they may not have the experience or proven results. And I'll, I'll listen to what has been said, but I also won't necessarily take that as being the gospel, you know? So part of what I'm learning in opening up this gallery and just in general with my art practice is being humble enough to know that there's a lot of things I don't know, right? But my level of intention is such that I'm not letting that be an impediment to making progress, but I also am open to guidance and feedback and, and so forth because there's so many things I don't know about. So I'm just every day I, I, you know, that I'm in there and with my full-time job, it's really kind of, uh, you know, stealing some evening hours during the week and, fr you know, Friday evenings and certainly the weekends I'm there all day on Saturday, but the times that I'm there trying to just navigate every little decision that I have to make to try to not to make any fatal mistakes, <laughs> little mistakes are okay, but I don't want to make any big mistakes and being also young in my art career, I want to make sure I don't do anything today they don't realize the impact that's going to have five or 10 years from now, which actually is the one little thread that I'm going to be, I think, um, exploring as to why the insistence about the prints came up. I don't know the answer to the question, but I know it has something to do with that. Well, I think it's very wise what you said about figuring out that there's so much more that you don't know, because that's where I'm at every day. I'm learning so much more about this art business and I've, and I have 20 some years in this already, and I have degrees in this. And, and one thing I realize is there's people that have PhDs in what kind of pigment somebody used during the Renaissance, and they probably don't know what kind of stretcher bar, you know? So you yeah. can get really, really serious <laughs> about like one specific thing, like, oh my gosh, this is how they ground this pigment back then. But they might 
did not know anything about like painting itself, yeah. you know? So there's a whole knowledge base of stuff. And, and I think that's what you're absolutely, we all are learning is that, um, the more we learn about it, the more that we realize there's so much more out there to learn. And, and I think chasing your curiosity is always the best way of approaching it. Um, uh, one myth that I very much want to bust right now is this idea of scarcity, right? And the reason why I'm bringing that up is, you know, there's a little bit of that idea around prints. And then there's also the misnomer of what a print is. Yes. There's prints and there's reproductions. Yes. So like a print is, you know, think of a lithograph or a seriograph where the final product, the original piece of artwork is actually the print. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Right. Whereas a reproduction is usually, um, you know, there was a painting or some other item that has then been copied and reproduced into, uh, you know, an addition. And that was the point, uh, fairly, of my friend was that, you know, the idea, and I loved how she took her camera or her phone and she said, you don't want to do this and then go and digitally print it off. That's a personal preference. And I am open to learning about what the reasons are. I did kind of put the brakes on that on that project until I understand, you know, cause she's had a lot of experience and I want to know. So. But this idea of scarcity, I think is so, um, one, uh, like thing I can point to is, did you guys know that Picasso had over 500,000 pieces of artwork attributed to him over 500,000? So let's, I'm surprised it wasn't more. Right. So let's say he even did, uh, a thousand pieces that he had additions of a hundred on. That's still like one quarter of like everything that he ever produced, right? 500,000 pieces of artwork. And some of them were nothing but a signature. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely have that sense that uh, I like that the things that my hand touches are a little bit more scarce. Yeah. Um, I actually started making prints, though, because I sold a really key piece to me, a piece that was very important to me, to a good friend who actually owns a, an art consulting firm. Okay. And she, I don't know, she she was the right person to own this piece. So I was okay selling this piece that I really love. But then I realized I missed it. And so I asked her if I could get a <laughs> proper photograph of it so I could make a print of it so that I would have it in my life still. Sure. And as soon as I saw that as a print, I realized that I actually really loved that as a thing that could go out into the world in a different way and connect with people in a different way. And that the piece of art could see more places in the world and could be a, a part of more people's lives in that way. And that definitely changed my attitude about reproduction prints. Reproduction prints, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, we could have an entire topic on what that is because, you know, I can just right off the bat, I think about artists like Kuzama or Mirakami and like there are so many different like products and ideas that come out of those in different ways that the art emerges. And, you know, that's a whole, whole nother level of stuff. Um, we are coming to the end of the podcast. And at this point, I, I always love just kind of throwing out this question as far as if you had just a, one piece of advice that you wanted to give to somebody who was, you know, just starting this process and this journey what would that be? And I'll let either of you take the first stab at it. Sure. Um, so the one piece of advice I would have, and it's really a mindset idea, is I think it would be important for anyone who's looking at taking a step into the art world and wanting to make a career or a solid business of their art practice is to... Um, gain clarity around their identity as an artist. So I was, um, I was at, a, at a demonstration that was being given by a local artist and ran into a friend of mine that is a well-established, um, the demonstrating artist was Tony Ortega, and the artist that um, asked me the question was Lorenzo Chavez, who is a um, highly respected plein air painter and landscape painter. And when he ran into me at this demonstration event, he said, oh, I didn't know you were an artist. And I hadn't really thought about that, but it didn't feel comfortable like accepting that label, you know? And, it, and I explored over a period of time of maybe two or three weeks, whether or not I was worthy to call myself an artist. And what does that look like? And what does it mean? And it ties into what you said a moment ago, Doug, about, you know, you know going to art school and, and, and getting your fine arts degrees and just the, the, maybe the, the perceived process of how you become an artist. Is there another path? And Michael, as you said, there's many paths. <laughs> there's a lot of different ways you can arrive there. But I think from a mindset perspective, I think um, everyone should get comfortable with the idea 
of whether or not they can embrace that and say, yes, I am an artist, because I think it'll open them up to a lot of opportunities that will present themselves with confidence that they can step into those different spaces and continue to advance their art career. And so what I did is I came up with three criteria because I'm literal like that. And um, one was that I was producing work that I felt was authentic to my own expression and that I was proud of, you know, in other words, proud enough to be able to put it on a wall in a gallery or show it in an exhibition or take someone's hard earned money in exchange for that, that piece of art. And that was the number one criteria that I achieved that. Number two is I wanted to receive the affirmation of an established artist. Because I just think from a peer standpoint, for me personally, it was important for me to feel the confidence that someone like Michael, if you came to my studio and you walked around and you said, yeah, you can say that one is a really a good piece of work. That affirmation is important as a peer that you recognize that and that, and that others in the art world would feel that way. That was number two. And then number three was I wanted to sell um, a piece of work to someone I didn't know. So someone that wasn't doing it because they knew me, that wasn't one of my relatives. I want my relatives to buy my work. I want them not to ask me for a discount while they do it, of course. Um, but I wanted someone that didn't know me to um, be moved by the work, or maybe it's the work visually and the story being told along with it in that conversation that I talked about in the very beginning. And it was, it was moving enough they wanted to take it with them and take it to their home and they're willing to exchange you know, energy, money for the item. And those three criteria, once they were met, then I said, okay, I can confidently and comfortably call myself an artist. And I think from a mindset perspective, it's allowed me to sit in spaces. I mean, even in this, in this case, I'm on day one, as you said, Doug, and I'm sitting here with two people that are very accomplished in the art world. And I feel like I'm okay sitting at this table with you guys. And that's just a self-confidence mindset thing that has to happen. Otherwise, you'll turn down opportunities. You won't step through doors that open. You won't ask enough for your work. You won't try for, you know, juried shows because you're not certain that you really are worthy of being there. And everyone, I think, has to come to that clear understanding that, yes, I'm an artist and I'm worthy to be pursuing this art practice. Michael, what would you tell an artist who is just starting this career path? <laughs> Run for the hills. No. I would, you know, if somebody wanted to really sit down and have a conversation about the potential paths of being an, art, an artist and just brought me a bottle of tequila or wine or something, and, you know, that is, a, that is a wonderful way to get to understand what that looks like. And, and that ties into the other part of, like, what the real advice I would give is. And that is make a plan. And the really wonderful thing about this plan that you get to make as an artist is that you don't even have to follow it. The, the important point of that plan is to start picturing yourself as what comes at the end of the plan. And as you create that picture in your mind, and we as artists are very, very good at creating those pictures, you'll always be taking steps towards that icon of yourself being in place. And so that's why that plan is important. And the plan is important because some of those steps are actually things you'll need to do. You might not do them quite the way you thought you would. But make that plan because that's what creates your vision of yourself as an artist, your vision of yourself as that person doing that in the world. And that's why you sit down with an artist and bring them a bottle of tequila and, and talk with them because you'll start to see how they see themselves as an artist and you'll start to see how you see yourself as an artist. And that is a super important part of finding that path and that success. Well, I see your next six months after bike riding uh, inebriated talking to artists. <laughs> <laughs> Beginning with me. So what, what brand of tequila do you like? Don't give out my phone number. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for joining me today. What an honor. What a pleasure. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Artbound podcast. For more information about the guests and what we've discussed, go to artistnetwork.com slash artbound. You can also find ways to connect with me and the Artbound team. We'd love to hear from you. If you've enjoyed the show, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen. Artbound is an Artist Network podcast and produced by Golden Peak Media. It's hosted by me, Doug Casina. Our producer is Daisha Clay, with audio engineering by Evan Rutherford. Director of podcasts is Jared Mayer. Executive producer for Artist Network is Scott Meyer. 
Trisha Waddell is the director of content. Sarah Van Patter handles all our marketing. And Vanessa Childers does all things digital. If you'd like more information on sponsoring or advertising on Artbound, go to goldenpeakmedia.com. I'm Doug Casina. Until next time.